That's right, I just said you all, even though we're in the Northwest. Can you tell I lived in Dallas for eight years? Hey, uh, let's come back together. I'm so excited to teach God's Word to you tonight. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, the first 12 verses. The title of my message this evening is Our Father's Heart. Our Father's Heart. This is such a, a, a profound and powerful passage. I can't wait to study it with you all. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would just meet us here as we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ tonight. We pray, Father, that you will use this evening to expand our vision, to open our eyes, Lord. Lord, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want the reality of who you are and all that you've done for us. Father God, to transform, to change us so that we look at ourselves and others in a completely different way. Not, Father, as the way of the world, but from your vantage point, from your perspective. We need you, Father God. We need your, your healing touch. We need your presence. So please pour out your Holy Spirit over this time. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to pull any punches here. I love my kids. And you're probably thinking, well, of course you should. You're a dad, right? But it's not just that. I want my kids to know I love them. You see, it's not just that I've got all this love in my heart. I want to communicate that love to them. And you know, my, my daughter Melina, hard to believe, she's going to be six here in October. I, I can't believe it. It just seems like yesterday she was born. And we kind of have this little game that we play every once in a while. And it's the I love you more game. Have you ever played that game before? You know, I love you more than the other person. No, I love you more. And then it kind of begins to metamorphosize into, well, I love you to Hawaii and back. Well, then I love you to New York and back. Well, I love you to the moon and back. Well, the other day she pulled this one on me. She goes, well, I love you to heaven and back. I'm going, okay, you're getting a little too smart too quick here, okay? <laughs> To which I say at that point, well, I loved you first. <laughs> because I loved you before you were born. But I want my daughter, I want all my kids to know, I have no problem saying, I love you. I love my kids. I want that to be deeply worked into our hearts. And you know what? If I feel like that as a father... We know for a fact that our perfect Father in heaven feels far greater about us than we could even feel about our own flesh and blood. How great is the Father's love for us? The Apostle John, the beloved Apostle in 1 John 3, 1 said, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. It's like a brain freeze for John. Think about this. We who were former enemies with God, now through Jesus Christ, are children of God. And all the blessings and all the benefits, all the inheritance now belong to us because we are God's children. If that doesn't wake you up, check the person next to you, make sure they got a pulse, okay? That is powerful. But let me ask the question another way. How much... Does the Father love us? This one, you think the last one, being a child of God, is powerful? Listen to this. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus before he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And he's praying a prayer to the Father. And listen to what he's saying here. He says, the glory, this is in John chapter 17, verses 22 through 23, the glory which you have given me I have given to them, he's speaking of the church here, the disciples, that they may be one. Unity, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Look at this. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Now notice what Jesus is saying here. 
It's in the context of relationship. It's in the context of unity between the Father and the Son, but also within the church, unity with one another. And when that happens, it's a message that is communicated to the world that guess what? God the Father loves the body of Christ just as much as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. Think about that. How much does the Father love you and me? He loves you and me as much as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. If that doesn't give you a brain freeze, I don't know what else will. I mean, I can understand why the Father would love Jesus What's there not to love about Jesus? He does what the Father would have him do. He says what the Father would have him say. I don't always do that. I've I've got baggage. We all do. But now that we're in Christ, God looks at you and me, and he says, I love you, and all the love that I have for my son, I have for you. And this is so important for us to grasp. You see, that reality of how much the Father loves us should transform our lives. I believe that when we understand how great and how much the Father loves us, it not only changes our view of ourselves, it also changes our view of others and the relationships we have with them. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 verses here, Jesus revealed our Father's heart when it comes to our relationships with others so that we're able to enjoy unity and love, a unity and love that will reveal that to the world we are the children of God. That God loves us just as much as he loves his son. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 7. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Verse 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, we've been making our way through the Gospel of Matthew. We've been camped in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And here we have the longest recorded sermon that Jesus ever gave. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. This was a radical message, as I've shared before. Different than anything the people of that time had ever heard. In this message, Jesus explained standards for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. We're told in Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus declared that absolute perfection is the standard for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. For he said, for I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, The scribes and the Pharisees were hailed as the epitome, the standard of perfection and righteousness in that day. But Jesus calls them out. He says, you've got it all wrong, guys. You see, the Pharisees, the scribes, they look at the outward performance, the appearance of a person. But God looks 
at the heart. And here's what God desires. God desires a true righteousness where obedience flows from a heart that is filled with faith. Why? Because it's transformed by his love and grace through Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary and rose again three days later. Now, in the first 12 verses of Matthew 7, we see that Jesus shifts here. And he begins to focus on personal relationships. And he contrasts the attitudes and actions of the Pharisees with what he expects to see from his disciples. What he expects to see from you and me because our hearts have been transformed by God's grace and by his love. And so when we're talking about the, the father heart of God, when I look at the first six verses here, I believe this is important if you're taking notes. We need our Father's heart when others fail. When we look at the first six verses of chapter seven, I believe it is imperative that we need our Father's heart when others fail. You know, at first glance, this section appears to have nothing to do with Matthew six. But when you look closer, we see a direct relationship. Here again, Jesus was talking about the eye. What if someone's eye is not clear? What if there is something that needs to be changed in their life? Here Jesus was helping them see that the transformation of the heart has everything to do with how we view those around us. Jesus wants to see us to see people as God does with grace, with love, and with a desire for reconciliation. And so that's why in the first five verses, he focuses on us. And to capture it this way, we need to first remove the log from our own eye. We need to remove the log from our own eye. It's important to see and to understand what Jesus is not saying here, by the way. Because this passage has been misinterpreted so many times. How many times have you heard people say, don't judge me? And then they quote this passage. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus was not saying that we should not use judgment to discern good or evil. Or that we can't call sin for what it is. Sin. Now, there are many scriptures which tell us that we're called to use careful discernment and judgment in our relationships with others. Actually, in this chapter, in a few verses, we're going to come to it next week, but notice this, verse 15 of chapter 7. Jesus said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Well, wait, there's a judgment call. So we have to reconcile this. John the Apostle said something similar in 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we need to exercise discernment. We need to exercise judgment. Here, Jesus is focusing on something else. He's telling us that we should not have an ungracious, critical spirit like the Pharisees had. A hypocritical spirit. One that exalts self and looks down on others. And notice, he's focusing here on Christian relationships because he uses the word brother. If you see a speck in your brother's I. This is about Christian relationships that he's focusing on here. If you see a brother or sister in Christ that has an issue, what should we do? Should we be like the Pharisees? I'm glad I'm not like so-and-so. What were they thinking? Jesus illustrates the point in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He does this comparison contrast. Very powerful picture. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. 
two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. Notice he doesn't say a sinner, the sinner. I am the big sinner here, he's saying. Jesus' commentary, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, there are some people who seem to specialize in finding faults in others. Have you ever met anyone like that? And it even happens in the church. But you know, I've been looking around, and the last time I checked, I don't think criticism is a gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus, by the way, warned that when we're bent on finding and calling out faults in others, it's going to come back on us. You see, the standard that we hold for others, we're going to be held to as well. I will never forget several years ago going to Africa. I was in Mwanza, Tanzania, doing a pastor's conference there. And during one of the breaks, we had all these pastors from the Congo, from Kenya, from all these different areas, all these different tribes. This one man came up to me and he said, I notice that when it comes to Calvary Chapel, you guys are only picking leadership from certain tribes. So do you have to be part of a certain tribe to be a leader in Calvary Chapel? I tell you what. I said, absolutely not. I knew where this is going. He's saying that we are making distinctions. We're being divisive. We look at a person's pedigree, and based on that, we will make a determination whether or not you can be on the inside or not. And I said, no, 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 no. Leadership in Calvary Chapel has nothing to do with skin color or what tribe you belong to. What we're looking for is people who love Jesus Christ, who are sold out for the Lord, and you see maturity in their lives. Amen. You know, this man who is saying that we were making distinctions, you know what he did? He went back to the pastors, and he tried to sow discord among the pastors, saying, all these Calvary chapels, only if you belong to the DRC, then you can be a leader. And so we had to hold him accountable for his actions. He was sowing division, but accusing us of being divisive. You see how that works? The hypocrisy of it all? Now, to avoid the double standard trap, we must make, must ask our Heavenly Father to search our own hearts. I think we need to be honest with God. Before we try to help others, Lord, search my heart. Make sure I'm in a good place and own anything that we need to own. John the Apostle puts it this way in 1 John 1, 8 through 9. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Ah, but if we confess our sins. He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's about being honest with God. Lord, I open my heart before you. Before I ever dare to try to correct someone else, would you please see if there's any fault in me? I come before you humbly, I come before you honestly. Lord, I don't want to misrepresent you. I want to be used of you to bless others. And so I 
open my heart to you. Then we can be used of our Father to help others be restored. I came across a story the other day of Billy Graham, the great evangelist Billy Graham. He, he shared that while he was driving through a small southern town, he was stopped by a policeman and was charged with speeding. And, and, and Graham, he admitted his guilt, but was told by the officer that he had to appear in court. So the judge asked, guilty or not guilty? And Billy Graham pleaded guilty. The judge replied, that'll be $10, a dollar for every mile that you went over the speed limit. I tell you what, I'd like to go back to that. Anyone else? It's a lot more expensive nowadays. Suddenly the judge recognized the famous minister. And he said, you violated the law. The fine has to be paid but I'm going to pay it for you. And he took out a $10 bill from his wallet, attached it to the ticket, and then he took Graham out and bought him a steak dinner. Now here's Billy's response. He said, that is how God treats repentant sinners. I love it. But you know what? I believe it should be our heart towards brothers who stumble and fall. Amen? Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul gives us a word of encouragement and also a word of caution when correcting our brothers and sisters in Christ in verse 1. He said, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. It links in beautifully with what Jesus is saying here. As I go to restore somebody else, Lord, I want to make sure my own heart is right, that I do so in a manner that represents your heart and character. Now, we jump over to verse 6, and we see Jesus shifts again. He's been talking about our relationships within the body of Christ. But now, we see here, he says that we need to discern who we need to share the gospel or Jesus with in verse 6. Notice this, he says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, we need to reconcile this out here. The Bible clearly commands us to go into the world and to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we're told in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. So, what does Jesus mean here? According to Jesus, the problem is some people are dogs and other people are hogs. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is this. They act like animals when they respond to the gospel. Jesus wasn't thinking of a precious lap dog. Okay? He's not talking about obedient canines who attentively wait for their master's command. I remember my Uncle Randy. He had polio, was, was, a, was a paraplegic, and he had this dog, the most obedient dog that I ever saw. And I was a little boy, and I still remember. He could put a cracker on the dog's nose, and the dog would just sit there looking at that cracker. But he would not budge until my Uncle Randy gave the command. And that cracker was devoured so fast, but he would not budge. That's not the type of animal Jesus is referring to here. The dogs Jesus referred to are the mutts that scavenged the dumps for food. They were unclean, untamed, wild animals. Likewise, pigs were unclean animals according to the law of Moses. And if you've ever been around a pig before, that doesn't require a lot of explaining, now does it? Jesus was specifically declaring, and this is important, that you and I have been given a treasure 
the gospel and it's holy. And this idea of casting that which is holy to the dogs would be like a high priest taking a holy offering from the altar and taking the meat and throwing it to a wild animal. He also likens it to the idea of taking a beautiful pearl necklace of costly value and throwing it in with the pig slop. You see, unfortunately, some people will reject the good news of Jesus Christ. And when they do so, and maybe you've seen this, maybe you've experienced it, they will attack the messengers and will mock and ridicule the message just like the clean dog, unclean dog. Or they will not recognize the value of the gospel or, and, and they will basically trample it underfoot like a, a pig. And Jesus was declaring that we must discern who to share the holy things of God with in order to avoid bringing abuse and mockery to the gospel. You know, Jesus once stood before Herod. Herod asked him questions. He didn't respond. Very fascinating. Paul wiped the dust off his feet when the gospel was rejected. You know, Peter captures it this way when it comes to responses to the good news of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 21 and 22, and notice the language he uses here, which ties right back into Matthew 7. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to, its, to wallowing in the mire. They don't get the value of what's being presented. And so, as we're told in Ecclesiastes 3.7, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. And that requires discernment. You know, that requires a lot of discernment. And when we shift to verses 7 through 12, notice, even as Jesus makes a pivot here, we need to realize the context, its relationships. And I want to capture these verses this way. Our Father wants us to ask, seek, and knock. Remember the context here. Jesus, why is he giving us more instruction about prayer here? He already told us in chapter 6 to avoid meaningless repetition and how to pray to our Father in heaven. Now, Jesus returns to the topic of prayer, and this is important for us to grasp because it's so difficult in our power and wisdom to discern how to interact with people, Christians and non-believers alike, to respond in a manner that Christ's commands are honored and obeyed. And so he tells us that we need to ask in verse 7. And we need to see in these verses a progressive intensity, asking to seeking to knocking. By the way, in the Greek, this is a present tense command, which communicates the idea that we need to continually keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's a command. But I also believe it's important for us to see that it is God who's giving us the invitation and the command. It's as if God's saying, I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. To keep asking and seeking and knocking suggests that we need more faith to trust the timing of our Father's answers. You see, we're not very good at this because we live in a culture that prides itself on efficiency. And we want God to answer our prayers right away or we become impatient. Can I get a witness here from anybody? Am I alone, right? You know, how many of us, let's be honest, you pull up to a drive through window and you see a bunch of cars there and you go look for another restaurant, right? I don't want to wait. Or you're in heavy traffic and what do you do? You're a lane jockey, right? You're going from one lane to the next. You're looking for the fastest lane. 
But you know what happens to me every single time? Whatever I think is the fastest lane suddenly becomes the slowest lane whenever I move into it. Anyone else? Every time that happens to me. Or we want the fastest computer, right? So I can get all the answers to all the questions that I have. I remember years ago I had this computer and I had this Bible program that someone had bought for me. And I loaded it up and I was so frustrated because I did a Bible search and it took forever. And then years later it dawned on me That would have taken a lot of time by hand, and yet I was so impatient with it, you know? That's just the way we are. Now, to keep asking and seeking and knocking is to understand persistence in prayer. Two things are certain about prayer. First, and we see this from the context here, that he gives us what is good for us. Therefore, we can also conclude that he won't give us what is not good for us. You know what? We should thank God for his no's because he is a good father. James 4, 2 through 3 says, You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see, we can ask for what is, not, what is not good, and even if we ask with patience and persistence, our God is a good father, and he says no. And I'm so thankful for that. God wants to bring us to a place, I believe, of maturity in our relationship that we can accept his yeses and his nos and the waits, not yet, with joy. Because we know our Father knows what is best. The other night, my daughter Melina, we have this ongoing joke. We, we go to bed and, and we pray. So guess what? For whatever reason, the topic of red velvet cake came up earlier in the day. And she loves and I love our red velvet cake, okay? So she says, and Heavenly Father, I pray that tomorrow I can have red velvet cake. And so after she got done praying, I said, now do you really think you're going to get red velvet cake? And she goes, well, I prayed it. And I said, well, wait a second. You need to understand here, God gives us what's good for us. And so just because we pray for something, it doesn't mean that we always get it. God's timing is perfect, and he's a good father. And he's instructing your father that right now, it's not good for your father's waistline to have red velvet cake. So we're not going to have red velvet cake in our house, okay? So anyway, it was a lot of fun. Now, waiting on the Lord means that we wait by faith, knowing that our heavenly father will do that which is good. James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He's a good father. And you know, as a good father, he takes our prayers seriously. And we see this in verses 8 through 11. In verse 8, Jesus said that everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And then he used a humorous illustration to make his point. He says, if a son asked his father for a loaf of bread, would he give him a stone? Kind of like trickery here, because the stone would look like a piece of bread, a loaf of bread. No, right? Or if he asked for a fish, would he give him a snake? Now, over there in the Sea of Galilee, they have these eels that kind of look like a snake. A little bit of trickery. Would he do that? Absolutely not. Jesus declared, how much more shall your Father in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? You see, God is our Father. He hears us when we pray. And he takes seriously all our prayers. We must wait for our Father in all patience and know that he's working in our behalf. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 127, verse 2. It says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. Look at this. For he gives to his beloved even while he sleeps. God provides. Former pastor who's now gone on to be with the Lord, Ron Mel from Beaverton Foursquare, wrote a book. Great title, Our God Works the Night Shift. 
tied from one, Psalm 127 right there. Isn't it good to know our God is always working on our behalf and his timing is perfect? He takes seriously our prayers. Now I want to look at verse 12. And we're going to close with this. Here we see that we need to change what we do unto others. Jesus now focuses on the golden rule, that famous golden rule, this verse that you've heard so many times. Now, it's important to understand that he's speaking here to his disciples, to believers, because some people have taken this to mean this is the way to salvation. And Jesus is not talking about the way to salvation here. This is the result of a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. We've been saved, and now we should live this way. It immediately follows Jesus' words about their relationship to our Father in prayer, but in many ways, this verse is a summary of the entire Sermon on the Mount. But it goes deeper than that. You see, if we have the Beatitudes in our heart, if you have a genuine personal relationship with our Father in prayer, then it will change how you treat others. It changes everything about us. You know, what is the greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. We're told in Matthew 22, verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One flows right into the other. Now some, and you see this in all the commentaries, have tried to suggest that this saying was not original with Jesus. And it's certainly true that many have said similar things like Hillel, Confucius, Hindu writers, Socrates, and the Roman Stoics. They all said something similar, but get this, it was in the negative. They said, if you don't want someone doing this to you, then don't do it unto him. But Jesus comes onto the scene, and his statement is positive, and it's proactive. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Then Jesus shows the significance of his words when he declares that this saying summarizes the law and the prophets. So literally, this saying summarizes the entire Old Testament. Now, why should we do the golden rule? To get others to do good things for us? No, because of our relationship with our Father. Because he's changed our hearts. Because this fulfills the entire counsel of God. Because it represents our Father's heart. I mean, imagine how powerful this verse is. This one verse can transform the world. Imagine if everyone did this. There would be no more crime, no more murder, or hatred, or theft, or assault, or road rage. There would be no more adultery, or divorce, or abuse, or oppression, or jealousy, or envy, or anger, or starvation, or church splits over the color of the carpet. And that's, by the way, what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like when Jesus Christ returns. And I can't wait for that. But here's what Jesus is saying. Even now, the Father wants to change the world by changing us. Now, we all agree with this verse. But I want to challenge us tonight as we close. Do we really take it seriously? We know that the Father takes our prayers seriously and we want him to, but do you think God wants us to take this command seriously? I think so. And it all comes back to what I said earlier this evening, our view of the Father's heart. And we've heard our pastor say it before, if we could only understand how much the Father loves us, it would change us forever. Tonight, do you understand just how much the Father loves you? 
If not, I want to invite you into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that you'd re receive him as your savior. Maybe you're here tonight and there's some wounds because of the people around you. I want to invite you tonight to bring your heart to the Lord and let him bring healing to your life. You see, God wants to not only change you, he wants to use you as an agent of change to bring change to our world that desperately needs Jesus. Well, we can talk about the golden rule, but do we take it seriously? You know, many years ago, and I'm kind of dating myself here, Michael W. Smith sang this song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Remember that song? Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. It's based out of Isaiah 6, where, where Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. I, I believe we need that. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Heal my heart so that I could be used of you to heal other hearts. And one at a time, families are changed, neighborhoods are changed, communities, nation, and world. That's what God wants to do if we'll just understand our Father's heart for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time tonight, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that even now, you would minister to our hearts. Father God, even now, that you would open the eyes of our hearts. We want to know you, Lord. We want to see you, Lord. We want to understand your ways. Lord, we don't want to carry around the baggage of bitterness and unforgiveness. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. If you're here tonight, church, with eyes closed and heads bowed, and you're saying, Lord, open my heart. And open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to experience the life transformation that you want to bring. I want to be used of you to help others experience that life transformation as well. Would you just raise your hand and declare that to the Lord? Lord, I want to know you. I want to see you. Heal my heart. Give him the invitation to, to move in your heart. Just raise your hand and declare that to him. Oh, Lord, we need the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Bring healing, bring life, bring change. We thank you, Father, so much for the love that you have for us that we would be called the children of God. Father, help us to live our lives in a manner that honors you and communicates to this world that you sent the Son and you love the Son and you love the church because we're in the sun. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Hey.